Well, good afternoon. I'm Chris Scher, Member Communications Director of the Society of Broadcast Engineers and the co-host of this month's episode of the SPE Web Extra, the SPE Chapter of the Web. This is a monthly SPE meeting usually held on the third Monday of the month. The SPE is the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals with about 5,000 members, mostly in the U.S., but also around the world. The SPE Web Extra is sponsored by Catrine. Catrine, unique experience, individual solutions, reliable performance. The host of today's SBE Web Extra is SBE board member Kirk Harnack, who is also the chair of the SBE Social Networking Committee. Hi, Kirk. How are you doing? I am good, Chris. Thank you uh, for uh, opening the show. I appreciate that. I understand you have a members update coming up in just a minute. Uh, glad to be I here. Do. And uh, the the uh, the topic today, Chris, as, as you know, uh, we we've uh, as we've seen every few years uh, in the past few years, uh, we've seen announcements of layoffs in the radio industry. Uh, we had, you know, some years ago, maybe it was 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, we started seeing a number of layoffs in the area of talent and programming as more stations went to automation and especially voice tracking. And now I hear some people who I know, uh, I know they're on uh, 10 or 15 uh, radio stations across the country. And uh, it's kind of a good thing and kind of a bad thing. And uh, there's, you know, all kinds of valid viewpoints on that. But we've also seen people in the uh, in the engineering field, uh, not just uh, getting out of the broadcast business by attrition, but uh, some of them also being laid off. A uh, number of causes, consolidation and more reliable equipment and budget cuts and all kinds of things. So uh, we thought uh, we would see if we could address that from a career perspective today. And so uh, right after the member update coming up in a minute, we're going to be talking with Dr. Barry Blesser. Uh, Dr. Blesser is uh, uh, quite blessedly a colleague of mine over at Telos Alliance, but Dr. Blesser has a, uh, an incredible career. Um, he was um, really is considered one of the grandfathers of the digital audio revolution. Uh, he invented and developed the first commercial digital reverb system, the EMT-250, back in 1976. And he helped start the company Lexicon in 1971, published a landmark paper, Digital Processing of Audio Signals, back in 1978. And he also co-chaired the first international conference on digital audio back in 1980. He was also president of the Audio Engineering Society in 1980. So we'll be talking with uh, with Dr. Blesser and getting his perspective, not, not just on uh, refreshing your career or finding a new job if you find yourself without a job. But Dr. Blesser is going to speak to the whole concept of uh, career and how we see ourselves involving uh, ourselves in what we do to make a living, to involve ourselves in, in society. And maybe we can uh, think about these things on a little broader scale and and gain some uh, some good insight and advantage for ourselves, our careers and our lives. So that's a big, a big warm up, uh, a big pitch for the for the show coming up. So, Chris, why don't you uh, Take us through our member update now. Absolutely. Here's your SBE member update for April 19, 2021. The SBE is planning the next leadership development course, which will be held in Atlanta on June 8 to 10. With the foundation going back to 1965, the SBE has presented the SBE leadership course since 1997. This course is designed specifically for broadcast engineers who have or aspire to have management responsibilities. The SBE offers the course in cooperation with instructor Rodney Vandeveer, a professional leadership and management trainer and professor of organization leadership and supervision at Purdue University. Time to register is running short. You have until May 10th, but don't put it off any longer. Register immediately after today's web extra of course you can register with no risk if the course must be postponed or canceled your registration fee will be refunded make your reservation and get more information at sbe.org ldc the annual sbe compensation survey is underway we need your help in gathering the most accurate data we can the survey is used to determine salary levels and benefits among broadcast and media technology engineers SBE membership is not required to take the survey. All responses remain anonymous. Take the survey today. Go to sbe.org slash survey for the link. The SBE launched a new series in webinars by SBE, the 2021 IP Networking Series. The first three parts are available on demand. Part four, Network Architecture and Design for Real-Time Media, airs on April 29. Wayne Piscina leads these webinars. And later this week, on April 22nd, we present Cloud Streaming, Techniques for Executing Content for Maximum Distribution. It's a tutorial on how to get started and how to make, the make it the best it can be. It'll cover audio processing, audio encoding, metadata, and distribution. The webinar will be led by some guy who has a little experience with all this, 
Kirk Karnak. For more information on these and all the webinars by SPE, go to spe.org slash webinars. The next SPE certification exam window at local chapters is June 4 to 14th. That application deadline has passed, but the next local chapter exam window after that is in August. Applications to take an exam then are due to the SBE National Office by June 11th. Also remember, if a local chapter exam is not convenient for you or not possible because of COVID restrictions, private proctoring is available. The new SBE Specialist Certification, ATSC3, is now available. There are a few people who have already added the specialist letters to their professional titles. And for more information on SBE certification, it's all online, spe.org slash certification. Almost done, Kirk, don't worry. The annual SBE membership drive started March 1st. It runs through May 31st. The theme this year is add power to your profession. Sponsor a new member to join the SBE and you as a member can benefit as well. You'll be entered into a prize drawing for each new recruit, including a chance to win a trip to the SBE national meeting, and you can earn a savings on your 2022 SBE dues. Recruit someone today. Get all the details at sbe.org slash drive. And also don't forget to renew your own SBE membership. It's officially due by April 1st, but you can renew online at sbe.org slash renew or follow the link button on the homepage. The annual SBE awards program recognizes those who have contributed to the SBE, the industry or their chapters in a number of categories. Winners will be recognized at the national awards program at the annual SBE national meeting. Honor your colleagues and chapters by submitting an SBE award nomination. Nominations are due to the SBE National Office by June 15. Uh, get more information at sbe.org slash awards. And chapters make note, if you're meeting virtually, you should still report these meetings to the National Office, just as you would an in-person meeting. These meetings count towards the minimum five held during a calendar year necessary to qualify for an annual chapter rebate. If you hold your meetings via Zoom, there's a way for the meeting host to export all the attendee information, which simplifies the chapter secretary's task. Chapter leaders, there's a link to the instructions on the SBE website under chapter administration. Go to sbe.org slash chapter, chapter dash admin. And that is your SBE member update for April 19, 2021. Quite an update. Ew. My goodness, that, that was a lot. <laughs> I think we could have yep, left the thing about Kirk on. Harnack out of there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we we, we could have left him out, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, I, hey, I was looking to see, is there a way to check your own member status? Because, you know, I'm getting old and I forgot if I actually renewed or not. Um, so uh, if you log nice in, it will let you know uh, what's going on. And honestly, I, I'm i kind of going off my memory as I'm staring at the ceiling trying to remember. Um Log in and check, and if you're not sure, you can always contact the national office, and we'll okay. let you know for sure one way or the other. Good deal. Or I can just check my bank account, see, see if I sent money along. Yeah. <laughs> that would do it. That would do it. All right. Had a big uh, big buildup, Chris, for our guest. You know, the question did come up uh, about engineers getting let go, having to find new jobs. And uh, for some engineers over the years, that hasn't been a problem. They've gone into, into telecom. They've gone into aviation electronics. They've gone into all kinds of, of different uh, things. Uh, and um, uh, But when uh, a number of engineers get let go or repurposed or downsized, um, maybe we ought to talk about it. And I thought of Dr. Barry Blesser, who is one of my colleagues at the TELUS Alliance. He's uh, got a lot of great advice on not only practical advice for digital audio uh, and concepts there, but also great advice for life itself. Uh, he's uh, uh, I, Dr. Blesser, a welcome in, first of all. And uh, I keep reading over this uh, little note that I wrote about a, a paper that I'm guessing you wrote. Uh, Your mind has a mind of its own. Yes. Actually, that turns out to have been a course I taught at the Harvard uh, Education, Adult Education. And that was one of the more formal ways in which I introduced to at least the class alternate ways of thinking about yourself and what it means to be human. So let me just give a little introduction of what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. I've got a life philosophy, which is mostly about the last decade. I've had a, some 50 or 60 years of professional experience. How do I leave my legacy behind so others can profit by what I learned without devoting 50 or 70 years? So the goal of this talk is to give you the overview of what does it mean to have a career? Uh, most of us, or many of us, especially those who started early, are really set up a philosophy that they were given 
And I remember in 1960, the expectation is you get a degree, you go get a job, like working at IBM, and it's a lifetime employment. If your skills become obsolete, they'll train you for a year or two for new skills. And once you sign up to the marriage, to the company, you're done having to manage your career, they'll manage it for you. Guess what? That didn't work for more than a few years as people discovered the companies who made this promise couldn't afford it, so they backtracked. So then the question is, okay, if you're not gonna have this guarantee of anything, how do you manage your career? So the simple answer is, you need to start shifting your identity from I'm an engineer employee who works at this company to I'm running a one man business that has to take care of me. I was fortunate as a consultant for 50 or 70 years, you know, that was built into my job description. I had to manage my career. Most of us say that's unpleasant. I'm not going to go there. Why should I bother? I've got these technical skills. So this talk really is about the world is caught up to the philosophy and I'm going to attempt to share you know, 50 years of experience in an hour, probably won't succeed. All right, so the first step is to realize that we make mental models of the way, the way we think life should be. And mostly those mental models prove to be wrong. But if they're wrong late in your career, you don't get much runway to, to update your models. So one of the things I'll start by introducing is everything is dynamic, nothing is static. And you can't predict the future. So how do you manage yourself with all that uncertainty? Uh, and that really is the challenge. So to give you an example of a personal example where I learned this lesson, when I got my undergraduate degree in 1964, I discovered I had a real aptitude for operational amplifier transistor design. Great. And I thought that would be my career. It didn't take more than a year to realize eh, that was not going to last very long. So the fact that the, the, the world needs things that, are, that evolve and you can't predict, I ended up coming up with some sort of anthropologic models, which really were very useful for me. So if you look back historically, using that as a model of the future, all technologies and disciplines and cultural bases start with a life cycle. So you get somebody invents a new way of doing something, a new technology, you might call that the birth phase. Then you get infancy, you get childhood, young adult, real adult, maturity, age, senility, and death. And if you look back historically, almost everything has follows this trajectory. Now, the first question you get is, okay, if I'm gonna switch into a, a new activity, do I wanna enter the life cycle at infancy, which of course has the greatest upside, but the highest risk? Do I wanna enter into mature, with the technology is at the stage of maturity, and each one of these stages has different properties. If you recognize that that's reality, you then have, okay, do I want to move into this domain early, middle, late? Some people love to do it in the beginning. Of course, they discover most of their activities fail because you get a lot of infant mortalities. So this is the reality. You may not like it, and one of the challenges for engineers is to, okay, Am I going to manage my life on the basis of what I think the world should be, or am I going to manage my life on the basis of what the world is? And that's a real philosophical choice that we all have to make at one time or another. Most of us don't get good wisdom in how to manage that, but one way or another, we're going to have to manage that. And so as I look back on my career, I can see clearly that there were a lot of these points where I jumped out of where I was into the next phase of my life because it was heading to maturity or with infancy was too much risk. That was a personal choice. There's no right answer. So those with entrepreneurial spirit love to jump in way at the beginning and because that's when the biggest upside, but they also accept the fact that, you know, 90% of their activities will end up in failure. That's part of the property of starting early. Other yeah. people won't start until the, the area has got, is well matured and then they discover the supply and demand ratio works against them because everybody else is looking at that. Now, the examples I can share with you are, for example, I shared ampli transistor amplifiers, motherboards. When I was in my 30s, I had a lot of colleagues who were really expert at designing motherboards. Designing motherboards didn't go away, but it changed so much. There's, there's essentially no employment opportunities. 
for people who are skillful at designing motherboards. Vinyl records went away after rising to the peak, then they come back a little bit, sort of like the grandchildren. CD technology was really big for a 15 or 20 year period, but there are other technologies for recording which sort of came and went. You don't actually know which ones are gonna come and go. So what you have to first accept is you got all this uncertainty, which means planning a career is not laying out all the stages because you have no idea what the world's gonna look like 10 years from now. So what are you gonna do? How do you avoid having to know the future, which we don't know, and you don't wanna bet everything on one thing. So I ended up with a personal philosophy. And one of the, one of the branch points you have is when you're studying and learning, you have to decide, am I gonna bet on the breath horse or the depth horse? They each mm-hmm. have different properties. If you, if you bet on depth, you become really expert, but you're hoping the need doesn't disappear on you. So if you were a super expert on transistor amplifiers, you might have been a super deep in that subject. There's no need for it. Or maybe you went into depth on refrigerator design. If you go into breadth, you're not going to compete successfully with other super experts. And this is a personal value choice. You got to make it at different phases in your life because it really determines where you put your energies. You got a finite amount of energy. Where are you going to put it? You're going to become an expert or you're going to become broad. Okay. Another factor that engineers struggle with is the fact that life is not dominated by technology. It's dominated by people. And most of us really have very little idea of what takes place between your ears. But what takes place between your ears determines everything. So it's a little bit like working with a computer and all you do is look at the CRT screen. Pardon me for being dated. (laughs) uh, But you have no idea what's behind the screen. So you can get a little bit of visibility. So you might say, okay, you really should understand what's happening between your ears. But that's really an example. When I started this in the 60s, it wasn't as a career. It was because it was, I was interested in it. So I adopted a strategy for myself of the more experience I have, the more opportunities I had to learn, even if it wasn't immediately useful, sometime later, it would prove to be useful. That was my personal philosophy. Each one of you has to come up with a philosophy and hopefully it's got some wisdom behind it. So that's the background of, you know, when I, let me jump. When I look back at my career, none of the successes that I had were planned. You may say, how is that possible? I had a very successful career. I didn't plan my career. I planned the strategy by which I was gonna navigate it. And one of my personal rules are, lots of things in life are luck but you need the skill to recognize when a piece of luck shows up. And that's how luck and skill combine. So the digital audio thing was a pure piece of luck, which started literally because I was playing video games at three in the morning at an MIT lab, because that was the only time you could play video games. Okay, that was pure random that Dr. Lee walked into that lab. He was also up at three in the morning. We got to shoot the shit and talking. He turned out to be an expert, reasonable expert in digital memories. He was using, you know, circulating delay lines. I was a reasonable expert on analog signal processing. So we sat there and said, how can we combine them? So we worked through this thing and we actually came up with what eventually became the first lexicon product, which is the Delta T101. And could I have planned that to have happened? No way, but I recognized the opportunity. So that's a typical example where planning is planning a strategy, not the specifics. How did I come up with that insight? I have absolutely no idea, but I came up with it, recognized the value of it. All right, and a lot more of these philosophical shifts. I'll share one more was a personal thing. When I went off to MIT as a student, my, my family considered me a genius and I was so smart, everything comes easy. And so I take my first, first engineering course and I got a B plus on the first exam, a B on the second and a C plus on the third. And I said, there's something wrong with this picture. What was wrong with this picture is I was in a mythical world of pretending I was smart. And the most brilliant decision I made is give up on the image, give up on this, I, you know, your sense of greatness and start with the assumption you know nothing. Now, when I look back 50 years later, 
that turned out to be a brilliant decision. Did I know it was brilliant when I made it? Absolutely not. So this is the short overview on how I got to be where I was. All right, so let's go, we'll jump back and forth. Let's, let's explore some of the skills that are needed to navigate such that you can recognize opportunities. So there's a technique in the 50s called SWOT, S-W-O-T. It's an analysis tool that was designed for businesses, but it works equally well, if not better, for individuals. And what it is, is a self-analysis with a colleague or just by yourself. And S stands for strengths, W for weaknesses, O for opportunities, and T for threats. If you run this tool with honesty, you know, every six months or a year, you'll recognize what you can do to combine skills and abilities that are not necessarily part of your main activity right now. Because typically jobs don't require the breadth of your expertise. But if you're gonna move from one domain to another because it's reaching senility or because there aren't enough opportunities, having a clear sense of all the pieces of skill that you can combine as needed is a great way to protect yourself from the uncertainties of life. Okay, so that's one of the techniques. It's hard to do intellectually, it's much better done by a colleague. And the one thing it requires, and almost all the things I'm gonna share with you, it requires you to get uncomfortable with honesty. I don't mean honesty mm. with your colleague, I mean honesty with yourself. And that's, that's a new phenomenon in the modern world really mastering what your brain is doing to you and your emotionality. If you want to live in a mythical world where you're great, you won't do very well. But if you can be honest with the strengths, so strengths and weaknesses is about you. And you may have surprising strengths and surprising weaknesses. Getting to see them clearly allows you to manage your career. Opportunities and threats are about the real world. So this is a routine thing that I do with myself, with people I coach, because without a clear basis of what you bring to the party, and it's gotta be honest, you're gonna make a lot of dumb mistakes. Okay, now once you get comfortable with this, you can then notice opportunities more easily. And so the example that I started off with, with the start of digital audio, you know, I'd recognized the strength I had in the analog stuff, and Francis Lee had the strength in something else. We put them together. And one of the hallmarks of a really successful career is packaging pieces that suit the opportunities in front of you. So opportunities and threats are about the real world. So a threat may be that it's a domain or a business or a business model is reaching maturity. It may be that it's no longer producing the kind of results. When do you jump? When don't you jump? Opportunities and threats. And I look at myself right now, in terms of opportunities and threats, one of the threats is I'm getting old. So my brain doesn't quite work at the same speed. But I've discovered a skill that I had been cultivating by accident over 30 or 40 years finally turned out to have enormous value. So understanding what your brain does and upgrading its internal operating system turns out to have great value today. It didn't 30 years ago. So this is an example where I learned something and got interested in something, not for the immediate reward, but because it was in front of me and I enjoyed doing it. And that turns out to be another property. By the way, Kirk, you can jump in. I can go on forever. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening with great, uh, I'm trying to come up with a question or two, but I'm writing furiously. This is just terrific stuff. I will have some specific questions uh, near the end if you haven't al already addressed them, but please continue. So I'm on target, okay. Absolutely. Uh, all right, so, so here you go managing yourself, but that requires you to know yourself, including when you, you got a piece of engineering technology, it may come with bugs. How do you debug it? Well, think of your brain between your ears as a piece of operational equipment that may have bugs, it may have been designed for a different purpose. How many of you have a sense of how your brain is working? And again, I happen to be lucky because I was at the early stage of the cognitive science revolution before it even had a name. I didn't plan that, I was there. It was a challenge for me, I loved it. I just kept doing it. And then I discovered by accident, it had value. And it was an accidental discovery. And then I discovered, okay, the world now appreciates this. So while you may think of this as the early seeds of psychology, 
it turns out the business schools have finally figured out this has real monetary value. And, you know, the University of Chicago has a whole piece of the university that teaches soft skills. And then you might say, okay, what are soft skills? Well, they're the non-technology skills, the non, you know, if then type of constructs. Do you, are you interested in learning about it? And this is really where you get to manage your time. Do you want to invest in the breadth or the depth? And that's a real choice. Everybody's got to make that choice one way or another. Most people think they're safer in terms of surviving by having depth. I am the world's expert on fill in the blanks. Well, what happens when that expertise is no longer needed? And that's sort of where we are now. When Kirk first approached me on giving this talk, I was thinking, you know, those people who've been downsized or the companies folded, they're not gonna find a job that's exactly like the one they came. The world has moved on, it's very dynamic. And if you're a world's expert in you know, RF transmitters, yeah, there may still be some need, but it's not going to be a mainstream activity. So you're scrambling. So it's really a matter of shifting your attitude towards manning, managing yourself. And this life cycle process has been going on for as long as I can recall. And every one of the technologies that I was part of has gone through the life cycle. And believe it or not, most of them are close to senility or the supply demand ratio has just gone really bad. Um, it was a technology called fax technology. People specialized in that. Desktop printers, refrigerators. And it's not that the refrigerators went away. They're not, it's, it's not really being evolved very rapidly right now. So if you're a world expert in refrigeration, you might get a job if you were lucky. But again, it goes back to the supply demand ratio. All right, now let's go to something a little bit more specific. Suppose you were not familiar with the philosophy I'm describing. How might you get started? <laughs> well, you might get started by doing some research. And I don't mean going to school, because I'll do a, a dig on the schools. If you look at the school and analyze them, the universities, who's teaching in them? Well, these are all the professors, quote, who didn't want to work in the real world. So why would we think they're going to guide us through this kind of navigation if they have themselves have no real world skills? And just to give you a con contrasting example, in the Middle Ages, a group of young people would get together. If they, we want to learn this. They'd go out and hire somebody with the expertise. They'd do the interviewing. They would pay them. So the educational process was being managed by the students. Today, that's not true. The university controls what you learn, whether you've learned it sufficiently, and they run the whole show as, as judge, jury, and deliverer, and they charge you a fortune for it. Why would we think they're the people we should trust? So since very few of these teachers have real world experience and certainly don't have the kind of experience that I'm describing here, you got to take charge of your own career. And maybe you end up you know, deciding, okay, I want to learn something. You go find how you're going to learn it. And one of the most interesting ways of learning, which requires a different skill set, is what's called informational interviews, which is equivalent of marketing. Let's say you're sitting there saying, okay, I got downsides in my job. I have you know, a buddy who's working in the stock market, or I have you know, the parent of some of my kids' friends are in some other industry. You do what's called an informational interview where you say, you know, would you be willing to let me buy your lunch? And in that lunch, you say, tell me about the world you see. You know, if, if I could be inside your head looking out, paint me a picture. It's a very different kind of taking advantage of other people in your life if you can have a relationship where they want to spend the time talking to you. So that's one example of informational interviews. And if I have time, I'll give you some examples of people I've coached in doing the informational interview. It's not unheard of, but if you go to the present world we're in, what's the scarcest commodity? It's not money, it's not food, the scarcest commodity is people's attention. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get somebody's attention, you got to say, okay, why would somebody want to spend an hour with me? And that gets to the soft skills of relationship management. You know, can you make them feel good to have lunch with you? How do you even find somebody that's willing to talk to you as a human? So one of the scarcest community commodities in having a job today is how do you actually make contact with people? And what does contact mean? And given the COVID, we're all hyper-stressed. So if somebody called me up and said, you know, they want some of my time, 
what would they how would they present themselves in a way that I would likely say, yeah, sure, I'll spend that sounds like fun. I'll spend an hour with you. Or go away. I'm not even going to answer the call. So now you're beginning to need the skills of how do you get people's attention so they're going to want to talk to you. No, it's not engineering and it's not logic, but it's a really valuable skill. And even though engineers typically look down on the soft subjects, you know, the history, the English, I'm an engineer, I do equations, I do calculations, but you're not going to escape being human in our world today. So the first step is you got to change your attitudes towards all those things you look down upon. Not good for you. All right. So we've got informational interviews as a technique, you know, and you might talk to somebody who's done it. How did you do it? Why did it work? The next thing I'll share with you is when you're actually applying for a job, assuming you can find a human to read your resume and cover letter, which itself is another challenge, which of the two plays the dominant role? Is it the letter? Is it the cover letter or the resume? Well, having done a lot of employment interviews for my clients, um, you know, I can tell you right off the first hand, the cover letter trumps everything because the cover letter does one thing to the reader. It paints a picture of you as a person. You know, you could have somebody who's really super expert on some technology, but you just don't want to work with them. You don't want them in your meetings. You're not going to get the job. So the cover letter really says, paint the picture. And to give a personal example, you know, my daughter was applying to graduate school. Did a good application was, you know, had all the check boxes. And I looked at the, the cover letter and I said, this is dry as toast. You're not going to get anybody's attention. So she said, this was 20 years ago. She said, if you're so smart, rewrite my cover letter, which I did. <laughs> okay. And that came straight out of the book, Getting to Yes by Fisher and Yuri, who basically teach you the principles of writing a cover letter, even though it's not about cover letters. And I ended up spending probably about four hours writing the first paragraph. And in the first paragraph, the first sentence took an hour to write. Why? Because according to Fisher and Yuri, this, this, I'm sorry, I got the wrong book. Uh, not getting to yes. Hold on, hold on. That's the problem of being old. Um, it'll come to me. Anyway, there's a concept called grab, which says the first opening, whether it's the first sentence or the first three words on the phone call, really serve the purpose of getting the other party to want to stay for the next sentence. And it's not the content you put in the opening, it's can you capture their attention? Well, you don't capture mm -hmm. their attention logically, you capture their attention emotionally. And that brings you to a very difficult subject. It turns out when you study how the brain works, the decision-making process takes place before it shows up in consciousness. What happens is it shows up in consciousness and then you create a rationalization story as to why you made that decision. But you didn't make that decision. You rationalized it. And this is part of the cog science revolution. We aren't what we think we are. And as humans, we're not what they told us we should be. Okay. All right. So let's just keep going down this thing. All right. So if you're really looking to break out of your current limited thing, you got to say, okay, how can I combine various skills into a, creating a job that's unique to me if there's a demand, so if there's a need for two people with the skill set and you have, and there's one of you, you get the job, which means basically it's the match between what you offer and what the need is. And the need is less and less about technology and more and more about getting it done. And getting it done in today's world really means working in a group because most of the challenges are much too big for an individual. The first product I developed in 1965, I went up to the barn in my New Hampshire farmhouse, and three weeks I did the whole design all, all by myself. Think of a design that you can do all by yourself today. That's a paradigm shift. You can't do any of this stuff by yourself because you'll take a thousand years to get a result. So if you have to do it as a group, what makes a group successful? Do you fit into a group? And that gets to the subject of the company culture and the group culture. If you don't fit into the group, it doesn't play. And then, you know, people have studied this stuff. And there's a concept called group IQ, which is much more important than the sum of all the IQs in the group, which means you have to change your identity 
to being a player that contributes, not the whiz kid star. And guess who's the expert on all this stuff? The military, because they've been studying group dynamics and group success for dozens of years, and they've got it down to a pretty good science. As to, do you want to get a group of six soldiers that are successful? They've got to be fused together such that they trust each other completely. They don't have to like each other. Mm -hmm. They got to each other because they're covering your back and you're covering their back. And if you really get group cohesion, the productivity is infinitely great. So in an interview that I'm doing with a pot potential client, I want to get a feeling for how are they going to fit into the group? Are they the prima donna that says it's all about me? Or are they going to contribute to the group dynamic, which then leads you to the subject of mentoring and the culture of the group? Every group of people has a culture. And that opens up the question, what is a culture? Where did it come from? Can you influence the culture? These determine the success of projects, companies. So those companies which are hostile cultures tend to do less well than collaborative cultures. And it's gotta be genuine collaboration, not just going through the motions. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, then I'll let Kirk <laughs> pick a little bit. All right, so now you're on one of these journeys, you don't have a lot of experience, what do you do next? Jump into the water, you know, go call somebody up, but keep a log of what you learn. And I'll give you one very explicit example from 30 years ago. I had one of the colleagues at a company, um, she was asked to stay after they closed the doors of the company so she could help with the shutdown. And she said, okay, I'm a good trooper, I'm a senior engineer, I'm willing to spend the next three months doing an exit for the whole company so everybody lands well. And they offered her great severance, great thing. She gets out, starts looking for a job, and one failure after another. Finally, after she was getting desperate, she called me up and says, I need some coaching. So she came to visit and I said, okay, you got a real problem. You're not, you don't have a brand that makes any sense to the person you're talking to. And I said, here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna try to get an interview. This was 30 years ago where she could get an interview. And you're not gonna try to get a job you're gonna figure out what could you learn about the interview process. After you get an interview and you go through this, you're gonna come back and we're gonna explore. What did you learn from the experience? And she, she, she got convinced. Why she believed me, I don't know. Anyway, so she's going through this process and she's getting very good at the interview process. She's learning a lot about the companies because she learned how to ask questions. She's extracting the culture. She's imagining herself fitting into the culture. So she's in one of these interviews and they stop it right in the middle and they say, you want a job? And the job was not as a senior engineer. The job was the vice president of engineering. She had nothing on her resume that reflected that legitimacy, but they saw her operate in real time, not from the resume. They could imagine her in their company, in their division, making a contribution. And that's a shift that's taken place. Yes, you may need a good resume to get past the HR filter, but you don't get a job and you don't get you know, you don't get a successful career just on the words you put on the resume because these resumes get crunched by computer. And even if they're not crunched by computer, they get crunched by people like me who know how to decode the words on the resume for what they really mean. You want to get a job, make the person feel like they want you in their life. It's that simple. Okay, what are some of the challenges in going down this path? For one thing, we're all human and we often have fears in our heads so we broadcast the anxiety. Yes, you may say the right words, but you can't shut down your broadcast. You go into a situation where you're anxious. And by the way, anxiety is an ill-defined danger that you haven't articulated. So if you're anticipating losing your house and your anxiety, I must get this job. Even if you say the right things, you're broadcasting this. You start broadcasting this and there are so many choices, you're never gonna get the job. They don't want the highly anxious person in their team group. So that gets you to the point, how do you learn to manage your stress? How do you learn to lower your internal temperature? Because you can't control the broadcasts. And that's something that's hard to accept for an engineer. You don't control how I experience you. Okay. Now, how do you live a life with this model? Well, look around for something you enjoy. Go do it. Maybe you enjoy learning a musical instrument. Three years from now, you may be able to combine that with the quality control of in the broadcast house. Or maybe you say, you know what? This is just as applicable to the riverboats where they have entertainment systems. 
but think out of the box because if you think in the box you're going to have a lot of competition and there's not and basically it's been picked clean by the time you get into a well-defined box okay here's another piece of wisdom most people think about their goals in life not a good choice because your success is determined by how many experiences you've accumulated goals are are, are fragile i can pick a goal i want to be a vice president of something x years from now there's, there's so many forces that are outside your control trying to aim for a goal is very difficult a few people achieve their goals most don't because the world is not consistent enough you could fail in getting your goal for hundreds if not thousands of reasons that are out of your control but accumulating experiences are your experiences and you get the right to combine them as you need so there's a very dynamic quality to managing your internal life and your outer life and that brings up to the next subject we tend to think of life as the outside world not what's happening in our head and it's hmm. not a great partitioning so when i teach people this stuff i say there's the inner space what happens in your head just by itself the outer space what happens when you're sitting at an interview or a meeting and then there's how do these connect together how you optimize these three domains requires three completely different skill sets it's not one size fits all okay next topic um we're always negotiating even though we don't think of it most of you most engineers have not really done any negotiations maybe they did a little bit negotiating a salary but it turns out you're always negotiating from the moment you wake up should i do this or should i do that should i put this guy on this job or that guy on the job should i focus on this should i focus on that and all these negotiations started with the premise you're negotiating with something in the outside world well it turns out the most recent book uh basically says you have to become good at negotiating with your internal voices because that determines how you're going to manage your inner world okay yeah maybe i should let kirk ask me something i keep going <laughs> kirk how we do it well we're doing great our, our, our time is good we're right about where i thought we'd be for for uh, this point in the, in the conversation um uh if, if you got a couple more things on your list we'll go ahead but before we end the show uh, in the next uh, 15 20 minutes i, I want to see if if you can boil down the things that you've been talking about into advice, uh, immediate advice for two different uh, sets of people, uh, people who find themselves right now without a job. And I realize they should have been thinking about the things that you've been talking about earlier, but we all should have been thinking about things that we, you know, we wish we'd done earlier. Um, you know, I wish I'd gone ahead and bought that Bitcoin 10 years ago. Um, the other thing though, is uh, what about for people who are right in the midst of their broadcast career right now, and they're doing okay, and they're offering value to their employer, what do those folks need to be thinking about for you know five or ten years from now when things may change for them how do they need and i love what you said about um experiences that instead of shooting for goals shoot for accumulating experiences i take it experiences that that may comport with your desires in in life but that uh, there's times in my life when i've done exactly that not not purposely just because i enjoy uh gaining experiences and those things have worked themselves into a, a modicum right. of, of success for, for what i've done so uh, if, when you want to get to it yeah yeah well, let, let me for, jump in yeah. okay so the guys yeah. that just lost their job or are dealing with it probably many of them have to deal with the panic and anxiety they can try to hide it from people but they're not hiding it from themselves and again this this person i described you know you're sitting there at 50 you know, you're getting tired, you've worked hard, you're done with the learning process, and you got, you know, you got some kind of savings, maybe a drawdown on them, and you gotta learn how to manage the panic. Even if you suppress it, that's the biggest challenge. So if you're going, to, if you're in, if you've been laid off, if you don't have a big savings account and a lot of asset, you gotta figure out how you're really feeling and how do you not let that anxiety bubble? Because the moment you get a torqued brain, your ability to think things through drops dramatically. And in particular, you lose the ability to dynamically react to what's in front of you because the brain is just preoccupied. How am I gonna survive? How am I gonna survive? And this really is the biggest undermine. So the example I gave you with this uh, senior engineer, we mm -hmm. spent three months lowering her panic level because with that panic level, she couldn't think straight. She couldn't get anybody. I mean, she couldn't basically function as a person with the panic and after two months she got pretty cool at it 
And so that's the biggest challenge. You know, it's, it's not what you, I mean, if you've lost your job now, and if you can get the panic under control, and if you've got some kind of savings, sit down and say, okay, what kinds of things can I learn today? You know, what's gonna turn me on? What's exciting? The learning process is how you change your brain, not the logic process. And that's a paradox. We're, we're emotional machinery that we're designed to survive and make babies. That's the evolutionary history. The logical mm -hmm. piece was a late artifact of you know modern life, but it's not the central thing that the brain was designed for. And that's a hard pill for some people to swallow. We were not optimized to be logic machines. The other category, if you have a job now, look around, learn how to connect to people, look around at all the things you might learn from other people. Think about how, how do you go about learning? And I've had, when I ask the question, I read a book or I go back and take a course in school. How about learning from people who are sharing their experiences? Because that's where the real learning is always taking place. And there's a wonderful story, I guess this 15th century, where a bunch of Western explorers decided to explore the new world. And they did all the precautions and they basically you know, stocked all the provisions, did all the things they know, they got to the new world, and after a bunch of months, it was clear they were going to die. They didn't have the wisdom of how to navigate that environment. And a few of them were smart enough to meet some of the local indigenous people who were not intellectual. They said, you don't want to do that. You got to do this. Or that mushroom is poisonous. Or if you don't water this thing now, and they say, how do you know? We just know. And one of the rules that, that got set up from this, if you got the choice of learning from a 20 year old or a 70 year old, historically cultures always went for the old guy. Why? Very simple. He survived 70 years of eating mushrooms in the woods and didn't die. The ones who died, obviously are not the ones you wanna learn from. So the wisdom of ages is not in the 20 year old, it's in the old farts like me. And that, that's a tradition that goes back thousands of generations. So find somebody that's willing to talk to you. Fortunately, old people often want to shift their identity to leave a legacy behind. So make friends with them. See what you can get by, by interacting with them. Wow. Set you up on another path. Wow. <laughs> uh, I want to br bring Chris Shearer into the conversation. Chris, I know you've been listening intently, and there's got to be a question or two that's popped up in, in your mind. I've, I've known uh, Dr. Blesser for some years now, and a lot of what he says always sounds really good. And I think I need to write that down, and I do, and, but I've, I've heard it for some years. Um, Chris, what do you, what's in your mind? Mike. I think you're muted, Chris. Uh, I think Chris is still muted. <laughs> I can't read lips. <laughs> Maybe we can learn that from Doctor Blesser today. How to read? How to read can lips? You, can you read his mind? No, I can't. I can't. I can't. That's that's why he's always along because he asks the questions that I I forget to ask. Um, so thinking about you know one of the books that you turned me on to, Doctor Blesser, uh, some time ago was well, actually the first. One of the first people, the first time I met with you, you said, Kirk, you ought to consider a book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And I'm wondering, do, do, do the concepts of that book have anything to do with some of the concepts you've been laying out for us in, in this show? Yes, they do. Okay, so fortunately for everybody, in the last 20 years, the cog science revolution has accelerated dramatically. Now, it's not that they know about what signals are going into which piece of your brain, but they actually understand at a slightly higher level how your brain is functioning. So I'll give you the nickel summary of that. If you had to think through everything you do in life, mm -hmm. you'd be running at 1,000th real time. You can't, you can't think through things, even though you think you might like to. So the thinking fast says things that you do a lot will automate and will run them in automatic mode without giving you any chance to think about it. But that automatic mode is based on previous experiences. And when the previous experiences don't work anymore, you have to go into slow mode because new experiences will drive the rewiring, but most experiences are run on autopilot. So one of the things you can do is, say, okay, let me get a feeling for when the autopilot is running. And you can do simple experiments, like you're sitting there talking to me. How does your brain decide whether to talk or listen? Should you ask an open-ended question or you should do a lot of talking? 
there's a lot of neural machinery that's involved in that. And it's driven purely emotionally. It's not driven logically. So Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow is one of those books that's a great starter. There are a couple hundred books like that that will introduce you to how your brain is working. And some of them are kind of shocking because it's not what you think it ought to be, the way you were taught humans should behave. We're not what we think we should be. So one of the great myths of the Western culture is its definition of what it means to be human. We don't get the choice. We are what we are. You might as well look at it without biasing the looking process. We are what we are. We don't want to bias the looking process. That's uh, that's pretty interesting. I got to think on that for, for a minute. Um, I, I, well, something translate that. We, that. Yeah. If you, if you assume you know what you are as a person, mm -hmm. there's no curiosity to look afresh. If you think you have all the answers, why would you want to open yourself to the possibility you're wrong? And that's a real challenge because we start with the conclusions in life. How can you start training yourself not to start with the conclusions? That's not uh, trivial. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, during our, our pre-show meeting and once during the show itself, you 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 uh, stated an, an idea that I, I I think is worth repeating because uh, I try to remind myself of this and I don't, don't always. What is the biggest added uh, added value that you can show? Uh, either to an employer or to maybe a group of investors or or colleagues. You said that people get things done in groups nowadays. It's very difficult Absolutely. to get things done, to be, to be a, a lone cowboy and, and get things done. Um, you won't uh, get a great career with a lone cowboy. Yeah. So they all revolve on, around how do you get your, comfortable with your inner world and how do you make the person across get comfortable? So the simple rule in an interview, you're going to get a job offer if you – if the person at the other end of the table is convinced their life will be better if they hire you. It's not logic. Ah, yeah. And better in the, a meaningful sense. And we, won't, we think we can argue our way through, look, I learned this and I'm great at this and I designed this. He's sitting there, his brain is saying, yeah, I hear you, I hear you. But he's saying, he's picturing a simulation in his head. I'm going to hire you, guy. What's my life going to be like? How much time am I going to spend arguing with you? Are you going to contribute or is it all about you? What's the, what's the family relationship? It's like getting married. You know, what's life going to be like after you get married? That's all he's thinking about. I think a lot of engineers, and certainly myself included, I engineered for a number of, of smaller stations. We get used to doing things on our own, that we're the expert, that, that it really does revolve around our skill set. And sure, once in a while, you hire other people to come in and do something that you can't or don't want to. Uh, but th th there's, a, there's a lot of revolving around the engineer in, in, our, in our careers. Sure, big organizations, different engineers tend to have different uh, specialties or they back, back each other up. My own self, uh, working, uh, you know, I occasionally work part time in the TV industry uh, in front of the camera. And, and that is a real education in the teamwork. It takes a team of people to punch buttons, write stories, uh, to deliver things. It takes a lot of things working together to deliver, say, a newscast. And that's been an education for me to work as a team, whereas, uh, well, of course, at, at my current job where I, where I work at TELUS Alliance, that's a lot of teamwork too. Uh, but uh, my whole career before that was not exactly teamwork. So I think a lot of people are in make, my, the same boat I've been. How did, you make, how did you make the transition from individual to team? I had a lot of great people at TELUS Alliance help me with that. I got to mention Marty Sachs because he's just, he's just been terrific. If, if, if would, would we all be so lucky as to have people who can help us see the, the value as part of a team? And the skills to fit yourself into the team where it's not all about I. Yeah, yeah. I still struggle with that, but. We all do. I mean, our, our culture is based on individuality, even if it doesn't work. Mm, mm, interesting. And, and, and the cultures in different organizations are very different. So, you know, about 20 years ago, a group of anthropologists decided to study disciplines because they were running out of untouched tri native tribes to study. So they studied surgeons, they studied a whole bunch of different things. And every one of these things has their own definition of group. So the surgeons, at least 25 years ago, it was all about competition. I'll never share anything. I'll never work in a team. It's I, I, I. You get some companies that are that way, other companies that are different. So one of the things in actually accepting a job, does the culture match you? Will you fit into this culture? And they're doing the same thing. You know, will this person fit into the culture? You want to learn about the culture? See if you can go find the secretary to take her to lunch. She'll tell you what the culture's like. 
I see Chris Shear is back uh, online with us. Chris, are, are you handy? Are you there? Yeah, let's see if uh, my audio problem has been corrected. Can you, you hear sound me now, great? They say. You sound great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, touching on the point you just mentioned, the, the working as a team, the second job interview I had uh, for a radio station chief engineer, um, I learned from the first job interview. So when it came time to interview for the second job, um, I went through the process and got the job. And uh, after I started working there for a couple of weeks, um, the director of engineering and I were talking and I kind of asked him, so, you know, you had other applicants for the job. Why did you pick me? And his response was because not only were they interviewing me, I interviewed them. And I guess I didn't realize I was doing it at the time. Um, maybe I did. I didn't consciously, but apparently that worked in my favor that um, I took that to heart to work as, you know, interviewing for the team and looking beyond, you know, what do I bring to you? What do you bring to me? And how is this going to help in my own career? Yes, exactly. so that's a good lesson. And the problem for junior people is they don't get places where they can go to get these lessons. You were lucky. I was lucky. Kirk was lucky. If you're not lucky, how can you create your own luck? True. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, Dr. Blesser, uh, we're about out of time. I wonder if there are a couple of resources you might uh, leave with us. You, you've, uh, we mentioned Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, uh, a book that's easily available all over the place. Uh, any other resources that you would recommend, websites, well, there's, webinars? There's a, I don't have an instant list, but I can tell you there's a massive quantity of stuff online. And the COVID year shutdown has been a blessing because a lot of things that people were selling, they're now you're putting them up online free. Uh, now you have to develop the skill. Is that worth listening to that thing? And so you really got to start, start at a different, what's worth learning? I mean, if there were 20 or 50 different things you could learn in the next week, what would you choose? Now you could say, I'm not going to choose. I'm just going to spend an hour and I'll browse and whatever comes to mind. It's interesting. I'm going to follow. And the key to this thing, you have to enjoy the process. It can't be goal oriented. I love playing with routers and computers. I've been doing that for years, and I, I'm a little bit of an expert at both of those, for example. So spare time. Just play with them. Play with them. And you could say, okay, if I, if I lost my current job or the, the industry went away, what would you do with your time? What would you yeah. want to learn? What, could you invent a new world for yourself? Okay, you've been working for people for years. Assume you could start your own company. What would it look like? How would you design it? And just going through the exercise, you'll start getting a feeling for what's happening on the other side. You know, if you have to imagine interviewing somebody else, or you have to imagine running a group and there's a conflict in it, these simulations in your head are great educational tools. Or you go up online and say, okay, you know, I've got a group of people, they're fighting with each other. You know, use the world's knowledge to your betterment. Great advice. Uh so much is available on, online, as you said, that and 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 free free books and, and free resources. Um, you'll find all kinds of things for personal growth, personal development uh, on on YouTube. I subscribe to a couple of channels there. Uh, hopefully, they do a little bit of good for me, not just in one it's ear, not out the other. How do you know what's learning? Because now you have to right. vet the, the source of material. Yes, yes. I mean, I've been doing this so long; it's easy. And for those people I'm coaching, you know, I give them a whole stack of stuff. But I got to be careful because I don't want to overwhelm them. And when they come back, I got to ask them what it. What was the experience like, not what did you learn? Great way to ask the question. Great question. What was the experience like? Yeah. And All right. when you're asking, mm -hmm. one more thing. There's a yeah. thing called empathetic curiosity, and that's a great skill. You want to know something, ask in a way that's not challenging, that's not threatening, and expresses a genuine interest in how they're doing what they're doing or why they're doing it. So you got to get your head in the right space where it's not challenging or competing. So if I were interested in doing what you do, I'm, let's say you're in the sales business. Hey, Kirk, how did you get, what's it like to be in the sales business? Now you notice my tone is not challenging, genuine interest, it's based on connectedness, and you're more likely than not to start teaching me. You call that empathetic curiosity, was that right? Right, and it's, it exists in a number of domains. It's not taught, but you can sort mm -hmm. of self-teach it and the alternative, I want to show you how great I am. So I'll ask a question that illustrates my greatness. You're not going to get squats for, for you know, interest in talking to you. Yeah. 
I love that. Great advice. I, I can think of a few, a few people in my life who have shown me a lot of empathetic curiosity. And of course, those, uh, those have been the best teaching and learning and uh, experiences. And Dr. Blesser, thank you. Okay. As I said, yeah, I yeah. Off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, oh, it it's hard to put a. We have to. You have to run out of coffee or beer to, to end the conversation. <laughs> thanks for the invite, Eric. It's a lot of thanks. Fun. Thanks for being with us. I appreciate it. We'll have the show posted in the next day or two, and I'll send you a link. Chris Shearer, okay. thank you very much. Uh, I think it's time for you to wrap the show up. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Kirk. This has been the SBE Web Extra, the SBE chapter of the web. We present it monthly. We hope you'll join us each time. We'll post the replay, as Kirk said, on our YouTube channel in another day or so. The SBE Web Extra is sponsored by Catrine, whom we thank for the support. Catrine, unique experience, individual solutions, reliable performance. If you hold SBE certification, viewing the SBE Web Extra qualifies you for one half point in category G. That's under attendance. It's just like attending a local chapter meeting. And that does it for this installment of the SBE Web Extra from the Society of Broadcast Engineers, the Association for Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Professionals. We again thank our guest, Dr. Barry Blesser. And on behalf of Kirk Harnack, we'll see you next month. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.